morning, everybody. I have to start off by saying that uh, it is a real pleasure for me to be able to have made it here after having had two cancelled flights yesterday, in spite of, I mean, thanks to nice weather in the east. Anyhow, um, it's very, very nice to see a lot of colleagues and friends all in the same place. And yes, you can quite see, uh, not totally awake, but let's see how it goes. Uh, what should we do with this? It's two things. Yeah. Okay. You're making this complicated on me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> better? So I will build on the first talk that Daniel just gave and uh, the purpose of my own tutorial is to try to introduce you to the other kind of major strategies that we have come up to try to overcome the effect of errors in quantum information processing. One is uh, passive error control via uh, decoherence free subspaces and noises subsystems. The other is active error control via dynamical decoupling. And I mean, as you probably can guess already, this is a lot of material to squeeze into less than an hour talk, so I'm not really sure that it's going to come up as pedagogical as a tutorial is supposed to be, but it is my hope that at least all of you will be able to get out the main physical insights and the main ideas that underlie these different techniques. I'm pretty sure that a lot of concepts will be picked up and uh, addressed in more depth by other talks later during the week. So. So um, just uh, uh, to give and to put things uh, in a broad context as much as possible, well, we know that scalable quantum information processing, of course, requires uh, that information is implemented fault tolerantly. We have already uh, heard a lot about this. And there are two main pathways by which errors come into uh, uh, the fate of a physical information processor, because basically a real world uh, information processor never has happen to be perfectly isolated from their surrounding environment and uh, the kind of errors that come through this mechanism, I will just refer the generically to them as environmental errors and also a uh, real world uh, information processors, they never happen to be perfectly controllable uh, due to our own limitations into uh, implementing gates, into preparing the systems, into measuring them and so on and so forth. Now, as Daniel uh, made it clear, achieving fault tolerance requires to be able to address all these different types of errors both during storage and during processing of quantum information. Most of what I am going to focus on in this talk will just be concerned with preservation of quantum information in the presence of environmental errors. So that's just a big prerequisite toward getting to, full, to a fully fault tolerant picture. But basically, uh, the kind of central insight I want to stress is, is just the same. And it is the fact that quantum information can be encoded into subspaces which are described by error correcting codes and can be appropriately recover, recovered after errors uh, have occurred. Now, um, thinking to a general framework where I wanted to put all of what I, the different things that I'm going to tell you about, in a way I like to think of all of what all I am going to say is trying to answer a main question, which is what really are the most general options in addition to the ones that we already learned about from quantum error correction for thinking to encoding information and to recover it from the action of error. Uh, just to be more specific here, there are two questions. Perhaps can we be lucky and identify error settings where maybe no active recovery is uh, needed at all? And this is the main philosophy that is going to underlie uh, the idea of purely passive error control and therefore DFS and NS theory. Or even if we are not so lucky and after all we have to uh, actively do some work to uh, fix errors, perhaps can we find setting where uh, the recovery procedure might be uh, simpler and no measurements are needed. So uh, we can go away in control theoretic terms uh, without closing the loop. We just uh, have open loop control and this is the philosophy that is going to underlie dynamical decoupling. And uh, uh, 
an even uh, more deep and more general, more basic, if you like, question, what is really the most general place where information can be encoded? We heard that, yes, in quantum error correcting codes, typically, uh, these are subspaces of the full uh, Hilbert space of the system, but does this have to be the most general case? And the answer is turning out to be a resounding no, and uh, uh, there is a long way uh, from there to go. This is uh, going to be the notion of a subsystem encoding, which eventually is going to come back uh, into uh, implications for quantum fault tolerance theory and uh, error correcting subsystem codes, operator quantum error correction, which is what I think uh, we're going to hear in the next tutorial. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, errors before I also need to say a few words about uh, how we model physically errors. Uh, part of this was already being mentioned by Daniel, but I will need uh, uh, to say a few more things. Uh, now, uh, this uh, brings back uh, uh, the issue of how to model open quantum system dynamics. Various formulations are possible. Perhaps from a physical point of view, the most natural one is to uh, stick to a Hamiltonian formu formulation for our open quantum system and imagining that our distinguished quantum system, the quantum information processor we are interested at, is interacting uh, to an environment. For me, by definition, environmental degrees of freedom will be not controllable, so this is going to be important for what I'm going to say later. So we have a total Hamiltonian, which includes uh, the self-Hamiltonian of the system, the self-Hamiltonian of the environment, a coupling term, and notice that I can rewrite this in this form, and for the purposes of this talk, which is going to be on preservation of quantum information, I will include the Hamiltonian, so unitary errors due to the Hamiltonian evolution among the error generators uh, of the error process I have. Uh, I'll say a few more about uh, this uh, later. Without loss of generalities, this can be taken as traceless operators. Now, uh, given this coupled uh, Hamiltonian evolution, well, uh, we are just going to be interested at the reduced dynamics of the system, and that is going to be given by partial trace of the coupled evolution in this form, provided we can which is not al always an obvious assumption, start from uncorrelated initial conditions. Um, the form of the reduced uh, dynamic evolution uh, turns out to be described for fixed time in terms of what we uh, call a completely positive trace-preserving map in terms of crowds or error operators, which uh, I have denoted by EA. And, uh, uh, well, uh, this is the mapping that you get for fixed time subject to the constraint due to trace preservation that you have the identity. One important thing that uh, uh, is worth keeping in mind is that uh, this description is in fact uh, uh, the most general uh, state change that is allowed by quantum mechanics, so in fact it doesn't have to come from an underlying Hamiltonian picture. And this is what I will mean when I will be referring as to quantum noise within the quantum channel or CP map formulation. It is just possible to talk about these two pictures. In one case, we have a Hamiltonian that is giving uh, the quantum operation at different times. In one case, we might just be looking at fixed time and one interaction of the environment with the system and just stick to this formulation. Now, there is another important, physically very important uh, description of open quantum system, which is the Markovian semi uh, uh, description. Uh, I have picked these two uh, formulations which are both formally exact. They do not incorporate the Markovian assumptions, both because uh, they are exact and because they are most natural for the context I am interested in. In particular, decoupling won't make any sense to be considered within Markovian limit. But one thing I want to stress is that uh, uh, decoherence-free subspaces, noise sub subsystem theory has been developed also for uh, Markovian uh, evolutions. I just won't have the time to tell you about those here. So, uh, sticking with the two descriptions that I have given uh, for uh, open system dynamics which generate errors, what are mathematically useful ways to picture uh, the relevant error sets that our error control strategy uh, is intended to correct for? Now, uh, 
if I just have a quantum operation that describes the system dynamics, uh, well, first of all, uh, the Krauss operators are never going to be defined uniquely. They are always defined up to unitary uh, mixing with respect to the original uh, Krauss operators. And also, as we heard before, uh, well, quantum mechanics is linear, so it's quite natural in everywhere in every possible way to assume that for a generic uh, quantum operation, the relevant error set uh, is closed by linear, com uh, by linear combination. So something like this, where EQ is complex linear combination of the error operators we have. If we do work within a Hamiltonian formulation, having a Hamiltonian allows us to propagate uh, things in time continuously, so there is more kind of structure that we can give to the error generation process. In particular, we can try to picture how different errors uh, enter on, and we can describe them on the basis of the order in time in which they occur in the quantum operation that the, the environment affects. So all I'm trying to say is that if we look uh, conceptually at a kind of a tailored expansion of the quantum operation that the environment performs, we can think that to lowest order in time, basically uh, all, uh, all that the environment could introduce into the evolution of the system is errors which are, well, if we're lucky, they know error, the identity, or otherwise errors which are linear combination of the basic error generators that we have. And this error set is going to be relevant for decoupling because decoupling is going to basically symmetrize and intervene in the dynamics uh, at very, very short uh, separation of time scales. If time goes on, then you will have the opportunity to generate second order error and ultimately if you are interested to look at uh, uh, arbitrary long time, what are the possible errors that Hamiltonian uh, um, evolution can generate, they happen to all belong to what is called the error algebra which is generated by uh, these operators which are the linear error operator here. So what that is, is nothing but uh, all the complex polynomials in the identity, the identity is one of our errors, the good one, and the error generators we have. This is an algebra in the set that you can uh, multiply operators and still have the operators belong to the set. And also, uh, one thing that I want to stress because it's going to have mathematical implications for later, um, if we are within a Hamiltonian formulation, actually every time that we can assume that if an error happens, also uh, the uh, Hermitian uh, conjugate error happens, well, the, rel the error set that describes the process is, is closed under Hermitian conjugation, which means that in this case, this algebra is also star closed. Um, now, I want to stress that it doesn't have to be the case for a generic quantum operation that if you have an error, also the Hermitian conjugate of that error uh, is in the error set. So this is important to keep in mind. In terms of uh, looking for characterizations and also for methods to search for a uh, protected uh, structure. But let's make a big step back and start from the beginning. Uh, DFS is, I think that uh, one good way to introduce them is to revisit the simplest possible example, uh, physical example where they can arise. Uh, this is a system, imagine we have a system which consists of n qubits, is defined on the usual state space with computational basis and we have an error process which is characterized basically by two kinds of symmetry. First of all, uh, the possible error operators are all diagonal in the computational basis, which I like to think of it as is the error process as kind of an axial uh, symmetry, there is a preferred basis. And secondly, uh, the second symmetry is that basically the errors cannot know which qubit is which that goes under uh, uh, invariance under uh, permutation operations of the qubit. Now, under this assumption, what, are the, what is the relevant uh, algebra that describes the error? Well, it's complex polynomial in this operator where this JZ, uh, Z is the preferred basis, and this JZ is the total angular momentum, up to a constant, the total angular momentum operator uh, in the C direction. Now, the smallest dimensional implementation, just two qubits, and these two qubits are going to be coupled in a symmetric fashion to a purely defacing environment 
environment. So the way that we can picture the arc factor is going to be imprinted in the evolution of the state. And uh, uh, because we don't know, actually, the environment cannot know uh, which qubit is which, for state of this form, the phase factor that goes here is exactly the same. And this is the key for physically being able to think that there is a hope to protect. Where did my figure go? I'm sorry, there is. Oh. I had a picture here with, it disappeared. What kind of projector do you use here? <laughs> I hope that's the only one thing that disappeared because that was just graphics, but well, okay. Um, Huh? Must be an error. No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so um, as I was saying that the key uh, for error protection is the fact that we have a global phase, so there is a degenerate action of this error operator on these two computational states. That means that if we appropriately encode by defining logical basis states in this way, then the evolution of any linear combinations, so any pure state which has support only onto these two-dimensional subspaces is not going to suffer any, uh, basically, any uh, loss of phase coherence. So this state is going to be perfectly preserved under these phase errors. Now, for arbitrary number of qubits, uh, the generalization is kind of easy to guess. All we have to do is to look for joint uh, eigenspaces of the error, of the collective error generator. In this case, we have to look for eigenspaces of the total angular momentum along Z, and this is going to define a decoherence-free subspace. In this case, for two qubits, we were encoding just one logical qubit. How many for a generic value of n under this error model? Well, this depends on uh, the degeneracy of the given uh, eigenvalue of JC that we are going to uh, consider. And therefore, there will be for n qubit a, m, uh, a DFS which is labeled by the eigenvalue of JC and uh, the encoding efficiency, that is uh, basically the number of logical DFS qubit we can put into it is determined by uh, the degeneracy, as I was saying, which is given by this simple combinatorial formula of the eigenvalue uh, itself. So how can we uh, formalize uh, this uh, intuition in order for it to be useful in more general situation. Here is the definition I'm going to stick to in this talk. I am going to refer to a DFS uh, as a subspace of the Hilbert space, which basically is not affected at all by the evolution. And I have to come back to something I was mentioning before. I am including uh, the Hamiltonian, the error among the error operators, the uh, possibility of having a uh, unitary error. That means that that um, in, uh, the terminology is not uniform here. In the literature, uh, DFS is often allowed to evolve uh, in a purely unitary fashion. Uh, for the purposes I am interested here, because I said I want to just store quantum information, to me it's more natural to look for situations where there is no evolution at all, and I will distinguish between this no evolution at all and the one where uh, you can have just purely unitary evolution as saying just noiseless or unitarily noiseless. But I just want to warn you that, uh, as I said, terminology is not fully consistent here. In any case, the key insight is just the one that we learned from the example before. And uh, for the purposes of getting a characterization of a DFS, the useful thing is to check whether we can have um, degenerate error behavior. And let me just uh, go through the, for instance, the, what happens in the Hamiltonian formulation. Suppose that we have our, J, our error generator, the J, what I call the J alpha, and suppose indeed that they are admitting uh, eigenvectors, these are joint uh, eigenvectors, uh, and uh, there have to be a certain number of them if we want to encode quantum information, not just one, otherwise it will be classical information, but the key thing is that 
this eigenvalue here depends only on the error that happens, but not on the particular uh, state that we have. If this is the case, and if we consider a state which is going to be our initial state, which is supported only by this joint eigenvector here, then what happens to, the, uh, to, the evolu to this state in the uh, evolution over time? Well, all this happens is nothing. It is fixed by the dynamics, and this may be seen, for instance, uh, here, taking the full Hamiltonian, having this operating on, well, tensor product, this is an uncorrelated initial state, and because of the condition that we have here for eigenvector, value uh, uh, in the part uh, in the system uh, environment Hamiltonian, then what you can have is just the same state, the logical state here, times something else for the environment we don't care about because eventually we're going to trace over the environment. Now, formalizing this into kind of necessary and sufficient or some of the necessary and sufficient conditions for the existence of DFS, I'm saying some because I'm not going to write down the ones for Markovian case. Well, imagine that we have our Hilbert state space, and we look at that as the DFS sector that we are uh, trying to characterize, plus the orthogonal complement, which is the rest. And for the purposes of writing down this, let me also imagine, imagine that I have made a choice of basis in the Hilbert state so that the first D uh, vectors happen to generate the DFS itself. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, in the Hamiltonian uh, formulation, a system which has a state space H uh, can support a DFS under a given error process with the uh, error generator J alpha, if and only if the form of the error generator, better said, the action that they have uh, in the representation, in the basis that, this, that is associated to this decomposition, uh, takes this form which means nothing but the fact that the restriction of the action of the error to the subspace itself is a trivial action, is a multiple of the identity. That's exactly the degenerate uh, error behavior that we were seeing in the example and that we are seeking uh, in general. Now, error generators are emissions, so clearly in the moment we have uh, this, uh, there is a block uh, structure that emerges here. If we go to the next line here, which is a necessary and sufficient uh, condition for a DFS under an arbitrary, completely positive dynamics, uh, the physical condition is, is still roughly the same in the sense that all the possible Krauss operators, the error operator, have to have the generate behavior on the DFS component. That's not going to change. But error operators need not be Hermitian per se. So in this picture, it is allowed that uh, there is uh, some coupling between this uh, orthogonal complement back to the DFS state, but as long as we initialize uh, the system perfectly in the DFS, this has no consequences at all. So you end up having a slightly uh, more general form uh, for the errors than you have here. Okay, so um, let me try to say a few more words. A good example where we can see this general formalism in action is uh, and more complicated than the first example that I was considering, but similar in a way, is still considering n qubits same state space as before, and uh, I will also assume as before that the environment is blind to which qubit is which. So there is still permutation symmetry in the error process, but in this case, no preferred basis. So basically, errors can happen uh, in X, Y, or Z, or whatever kind of direction you have. So uh, the error process that uh, a situation like this is going to um, depict is, is uh, in general, goes under the name of a collective uh, decoherence process, and the relevant uh, uh, error set is characterized by being described in terms of totally symmetric uh, operators. There is something funny with this viewer here. It also chopped the complex, see? Errors, okay. 
That's funny. Um, so in this case, uh, what we have to look at is the totally symmetric complex polynomial in both the identity and all the three error generators for the three direction, uh, x, y, and z. And I would like to stress the physical meaning of these error generators because they are the total angular momentum operators. What they do is like they generate uh, collective rotations uh, of the qubits uh, by angular momentum theory. Okay, uh, they happen uh, as such to obey commutation rules which tell us that they form a representation of a Lie algebra on the state which is represented on the state space. This is the ICU2 Lie algebra. And uh, what can be, this is a general characterization of a collective error process, uh, physically, a particularly uh, transparent physical realization comes from the so-called collective uh, spin boson coupling. In this case, the interaction between the system and the environment is just described by collective excitations. These are bosonic uh, environment modes, so collective excitation collective de-excitation, and then the possibility of collecting uh, de-phasing. Um, so our task is given an error process which obeys this symmetry condition, how are we going to find DFSs and uh, uh, how large are they going to be? We have all the tools uh, from before. What we have to look is joint eigenvectors of the error generators. The physical intuition behind, we said that error Generators here, they generate the collective rotations on the spin space. We are looking for, uh, for the FS condition, we are looking for states which are invariant under the action of these errors. But we know from uh, angular momentum theory that states that are invariant under rotations are scalar, are those which in group theoretical term, they transform according to the one-dimensional irreducible representation of the rotation group into, in three dimensions. These are well known. These are the singlet states, uh, and they correspond to the total angular momentum eigenvalue j equal to zero. So we are almost there, except that if we want to be able to encode, let's say, a full DFS logical qubit, we need a two-dimensional space. So we need at least a, a two linearly independent such states, so we need at least two copies of the singlet representation to occur. Now, it's a matter to go back to uh, the rules for uh, angular momentum addition, and we can easily convince ourselves that uh, in order for the total eigenvalue j equal to zero to come up twice, we need at least uh, four physical qubits, four angular momentum equal to one half to uh, be there. So, after having gone through this as an exercise, in fact, what you find is a beautiful DFS qubit, uh, which uh, may be described in terms of encoded zero, encoded one. In this way, this is, uh, well, we have j equal to zero quantum number, so m, the z component is also equal to zero. This eta quantum number is where we encode the information. Uh, this eta equal to zero, that's the first copy of the singlet. Eta equal to one, just say, this is the second copy of the singlet. And what you have here, what I put down here is the way in which you can construct these four uh, qubit states by pairing together uh, the first and the second qubit and then the third and the fourth. So this is a singlet state for one and two, singlet for three and four. And what you have here instead, it would be the uh, z equal to plus one component of the triplet for the first two qubits, tensor the z equal, j z equal to minus one uh, component for the triplet for three and four, and so on and so forth. Now, here we have two copies of the singlet, a two-dimensional protected subspace, one logical qubit. In general, again, the encoding efficiency will be determined by the degeneracy of the relevant value of angular momentum we are seeking, and in this case, uh, the degeneracy of the singlet representation, which is computable in this way by angular momentum uh, theory. Now, as it turns out, this is an example, in fact, but the fact of characterizing DFSs as the singlet representation of a certain algebra which describes the error process for the system is 
more general than that, this characterization holds, in fact, for arbitrary star-closed error algebras. But before getting to that, what I'd like to, to do is to uh, stick with this error model and just uh, ask a very naive question, which was asked, indeed, years ago, and say, well, what if I just have three qubits, not four, under the same error model. Uh, in this case, clearly, there is no way I can compose this triangular momenta one-half to get uh, j equal to zero. There is no singlet, there is no state that can stay invariant under the action of collective uh, rotation. So can I still manage to protect a qubit against this same error model. Certainly I cannot do it by encoding in a DFS like I was doing before because there is no singlet. However, the symmetry is the same and there are still two possible ways for composing the angular momenta of the individual particles to give a value. In this case we can have either three halves or one half and there is still one of these values, the value j equal to one half, that can be obtained in two uh, different ways. So what is uh, the key point about it? That if I go through these two paths for getting total angular momentum equal to one half, basically as long as the symmetry is there, so the noise, the errors cannot distinguish which qubit is which, they can also not know which we are taking to get a total angular momentum equal to one half, so we are perfectly uh, fine by still encoding in the multiplicity quantum number of a degenerate irreducible representation. Okay, let me go through this a little bit more carefully. In this case, I have three qubits, as I said, state space here. The collective, the possible uh, collective errors, this is the corresponding algebra, can be looked as the direct sum of the irreducible J1 half component and the irreducible J3 half component. Um, correspondingly, the state space uh, can be seen as the uh, sector corresponding to j equal to one half, the one corresponding to j equal to three half. This part here, this subspace is kind of uh, uninteresting from our point of view. It is uh, uh, a basis for this subspace, which is four dimensional, is just given by angular momentum uh, states, j equal to three half, and then we have the projection along the C basis. But if we look at the j equal to one half component, just specifying value j equal to one half and jc equal to plus minus one half clearly doesn't make up four states. We need an extra quantum number and that extra quantum number, which is a dichotomic quantum number, is the one that is telling us which copy of the representation, which path we have been uh, choosing for getting angular momentum equal to one half. So uh, now I have just restricted myself to the j equal to one half subspace. Uh, what is a suitable basis uh, for that subspace? I have written down here, it looks complicated, but the physics behind it is not that complicated. Uh, you can uh, think of a basis of state by specifying j, by specifying the uh, projection along the c basis, and then I have the first copy is labeled by eta equal to zero, that gives me two states here, and then I need a second copy, eta equal to one half, to one. And by uh, putting uh, these four possibilities together, what I end up having is four states, key point being that as long as we have this symmetry, the errors, yeah, they can, for instance, couple the plus one half and the minus one half sector, but they won't be able to change a zero into a one. Now, more formally, you can play with this example and see that all possible collective errors, that is, any operator which belong to this algebra, if you look at it in this representation, where you give to the Hilbert space this basis, uh, well, it has an action that looks like this. This is an eight by eight matrix, but this, this is a four by four, four by four, and so the important thing is that uh, the action 
on uh, this four-dimensional j equal to one-half subspace is like a certain matrix which depends on the error you have and it has an identity action on the multiplicity degree of freedom which to me is going to be the logical uh, degree of freedom which encodes noiselessly uh, quantum information. So this identity action still captures the essence of having the generate error behavior. Now, uh, as a dual uh, observation here, this is how error look like in the logical tensor, I'm gonna call it like syndrome because this other degree of freedom takes on all the action of the error. How are uh, observables for noise subsystem look like? They are kind of uh, dual to this and in fact they are uh, mixing logical observables are going to couple the zeros and the one and leave the other degree of freedom alone. Okay, uh, let's try to formalize uh, this notion. I am going to define a noise subsystem uh, with state space H and S. In the most general sense, this is going to be a factor in tensor product uh, of a subspace of the full Hilbert space, which is not affected uh, by the evolution. Same comment I was having before, uh, I can also uh, go with a weaker constraint and talk about unitarily noiseless uh, uh, system. Well, the difference is that in that case, information is allowed to move unitarily around. And if I want to recover uh, for that kind of unitary error, well, basically all I need is, is a clock that can keep track of that evolution. Now, uh, the definition is formally quite similar, but I would like to make the point that there is a rather um, profound difference between um, the DFS and the NS notion. Namely, uh, DFS, as we said many times by now, can be associated to states which do not evolve. They are fixed under the evolution. And basically, of course, information which is encoded in a DFS uh, is preserved forever because the state does not evolve, period. In the case of an NS, uh, uh, well, it is not true that the full state of the physical system will necessarily be fixed by the evolution. However, information which is encoded in an NS is still protected forever uh, because all the errors can do, the bad things that can happen, they only happen in the factor, the syndrome factor we do not care about. Okay, but uh, one thing which is important to keep in mind is that even though I can find some uh, initial states of this syndrome for which perhaps this state is going to be fixed, well, in general, for a noise subsystem like this, uh, these states need not to be preserved pure state. Now again, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, an NSs. I start in this case with the uh, condition for an NS to exist under a generic, uh, completely positive uh, map. Well, again, I look in this case at the uh, decomposition of the state space as the NS factor, the COSAP system, and the rest. And uh, I will uh, say that N, uh, HNS supports, this is the state space of a noise subsystem under the error model we have if there are two things here. First of all, we have to make sure that this subspace here remains invariant under error operators, but most importantly, the action of the relevant error operators has to be trivial on the NS factor. Trivial in the following sense, when I restrict an arbitrary error operator on this uh, subspace, there is an identity that occurs in the noise subsystem factor. Now, this is a uh, characterization for CP map when I have the stronger uh, condition of having a star closed error setting, it is possible to basically characterize all the possible noise subsystem we have by borrowing from powerful results from representation theory of star closed operators algebra. And uh, this theorem basically uh, tells us that uh, we have a noise subsystem under the action of such star closed error setting whenever we have an irreducible representation of what? Not of the error algebra itself, but of 
another algebra, which is the commutant of this error algebra, and it includes all the operators which commute with all the errors in A. Now, corresponding to this, we have a decomposition of the state space as a direct sum of tensor product factor such that the action of each and every error operator in the algebra is like an identity on this factor times something else on the other factor which carries the uh, irreducible representation of the errors and correspondingly uh, operators which commute with the error they are only going to uh, move around the logical uh, states and leave this factor at alone. Now clearly uh, or I, at least I hope, clearly I'm not sure because this is fast, um, the condition for a decoherence-free subspace, a decoherence-free subspace is nothing but a special case of this situation where we have the syndrome factor, which is just trivial, it's just one dimensional, it's just complex space, and therefore, uh, basically, we have just this factor here, which corresponds to the J equals zero case I started off uh, before. Now, a couple of examples, uh, and then I will move on on other things. Um, let me stay with two qubits and uh, describe what is the most simple and as possible that can happen physically. If you have two qubits and you have errors that only occur on one of them, say that they occur here only on qubit two, so my CP map is of the form like identity on one and whatever allowed a CP map on two only, of this form, it can be depolarization, amplitude damping, dephasing. Well, whatever that does, clearly physical intuition says that the uh, one is noiseless. There is no error acting on that. And this fits into the picture we have. In this case, noises observables are of the form uh, of being non-trivial on the first factor and identity here, they commute with errors. And uh, furthermore, looking at things that will commute with error, if we have noise, if we have errors which are unital, that means that they fix the identity state, uh, there is more we can say that this commutant of the errors also contains states which are fixed in the sense that if I consider a row and the identity, well, this is the noiseless factor, it goes here, and then if I preserve the identity, then I'm going to look at something like this. But notice that this state is mixed. Now, um, second example, slightly more complicated, and I'll probably leave it to you as a homework, but uh, all it consists of is two error operators, one of which is Hermitian, the other one is non Hermitian, and overall you can check that this uh, quantum operation here is non unital It does not uh, fix the identity state. What kind of preserved information can we stick into the state space of the system given these errors? Well, we have at least two choices. Actually, we have two choices is here. One is kind of intuitive because as I blocked out the action of the error here, we have immediately a degenerate action on this two by two block. This is actually the same DFS that we were looking before. But notice that if I consider a state in this DFS, it does not commute with the errors at all. Another one, this is kind of a funny DF, uh, NS, a noisy subsystem, you can uh, realize that it's there under this error process by rewriting, um, by writing down a state, which is the, a state of Bell, a basis of Bell states for this Hilbert space, and uh, associate a quantum number, which uh, I call this the parity, the even or odd, to the fact that you have either a plus or a minus, and then this zero one says like you either have two uh, bits of the same type, so two bits, so this, this one is nothing but the sum modulus two of the bit string that you have here. As it turns out, the parity is conserved, and this is a noiseless subsystem that is also supported by this error set. Now, one main reason for me to put up this transparency is to, uh, I'd like you to take away the point that if errors are unital, more generally, if the error process can be described by a star-closed uh, structure, well, um, 
Noise SF system can in some sense be signaled naturally from the, by the presence of fixed points which are in the commutant of the error process, but knowing the commutant does not exhaust all the good possibilities we might need for in order to be able to find subsystem. And I think that this, is, uh, this has implication for the question which I won't address at all, or, well, how am I going to find subsystems in general constructively, uh, but I'd like you to take this problem in mind. It has been solved, but I won't have time to tell you how. Instead, since I have to move on quickly on decoupling, uh, some lessons that we have learned. Quantum information uh, is the key quantity we want to protect, not necessarily the full pure state of the system. Uh, information resides in a noise SF system when we have passive error control, and it's basically protective in symmetry. Now, this lesson that quantum information resides in a, no in a subsystem is actually much uh, broader than we could have uh, thought at the beginning. In fact, it turns out that it is the cornerstone of what has become known as the subsystem principle. Uh, it is always the case that at each and every point in time when we have a quantum information processor, we can identify subsystems which carry information. And therefore, this uh, decomposition as having a computational factor, tensor, a co-subsystem, and the rest is always going to be the relevant one when we are trying to think of preserved information. Now, uh, this factor here, I like to think of it as coming um, out in different ways depending on the degree, depending on how the symmetry manifests in the system. In passive error control, I said a few times, we are lucky. Uh, symmetry is naturally present in the error process. We need to do nothing. Uh, this is kind of an infinite distance quantum error correcting code. There is no recovery uh, that is needed for the purposes of uh, preserving information. When no natural noise subsystem exists, we have to do something active on the system to preserve information. And for finite distance quantum error correction and more generally operator QEC, well, we can either use an initialization quantum operation before the errors happen and have a protectable subsystem, or we can use a recovery uh, quantum operation after the errors have taken place and have an error correcting subsystem. Or yet another option, we can try to continuously maintain uh, quantum information while errors are happening in time. And this is where the coupling uh, strategies come into play. Okay. So, uh, dynamical decoupling uh, was, I, I think if, if you are not familiar with the basic idea, it's always good to revisit the simplest possible example where the strategy comes about. Suppose that I start with a single qubit which is interacting, is defaced by a bosonic bath, a Hamiltonian of this form, there is a sigma z here, it can just induce dephasing. Uh, intuition says that because this coupling has a certain value when the qubit is up and another value when the qubit is down, if we can rapidly flip uh, the state of the qubit, we should on average be able to get rid of the unwanted dephasing effect. That this intuition is correct uh, turns out to be the case. Uh, the flipping is implemented by a train of identical pi pulses which are separated by a certain fixed amount of time. And uh, uh, I'm going to assume for a for, uh, for the following, that these pulses are arbitrarily strong and fast, which has become known as bang-bang setting. The observation is that this is the free decoherence behavior of the qubit. If you pulse, if you kick this system and make the separation between consecutive pulses shorter than the correlation time that characterizes this dephasing, well, decoherence gets suppressed. Now, this is an example we would like to generalize, get a setting, and the setting is like, I have a system, I have an environment, the environment, as I said at the very beginning, is not controllable. So the only control action I can exert is on the system degree of freedom. Formally, I am going to adjoin a time-dependent Hamiltonian that acts on the system, and actually for the purposes of designing uh, the control Hamiltonian, I will look at the time exponential of that, which is the control propagator. So uh, this gives rise to, I'm going to 
propagate forward the joint system and environment state uh, by this, and uh, I can always make a canonical transformation and look at the evolution in a frame, in an interaction picture that follows that control. Now, uh, decoupling as a general control theoretic problem might be always pictured as the problem of steering uh, some uh, unitary evolution, which is the joint unitary evolution of the system and environment, under a restricted set of control capabilities under a certain uh, set of assumptions. Now, among the simplest possible assumptions that I can make is that the controller has a natural periodicity associated to that. So I'm going to consider a control propagator with a cycle time, which means that basically at every multiple of the cycle time, the evolution of the system is going to be described by this propagator. So if the Hamiltonian of the system, the open system I consider, is time independent, and I have to make a kind of a subtle assumption here, uh, it is also norm bounded in some appropriate norm, I need this for convergence reason, then it is an exact result of so-called average Hamiltonian theory that the evolution at stroboscopic times may be described in terms of a time independent Hamiltonian, which is the average Hamiltonian of the problem, and it's given by an infinite series, which is the Magnus series, in terms of zeros first and so on and so forth, correction. Now, this series is convergent in some appropriate domain, which is determined by the norm of the total Hamiltonian we have. And one important feature is that the higher order terms, higher with respect to zero, they scale as a power of here. So mathematically, the whole average Hamiltonian approaches just the zeroth order term if we can kill all the other. That happens if we are in a limit where we squeeze the cycle time to zero, which means that we have a fixed evolution time, we divide it into many, many, many uh, intervals, and then uh, this number of interval goes to infinity and Tc goes to zero by keeping the fixed time uh, constant. Um, okay. So this is going to be the zero order Hamiltonian that comes up. It is not clear, it's not obvious at all to make sure physically that this condition of having a vanishing small time scale is uh, satisfied. That depends on having a time scale, Tc, which is able to be much shorter than the relevant correlation time we have. This is a physical problem. For the moment, let me assume that we are able to match this situation, and let me focus on the design of the zeroth order term only. So the simplest possible uh, decoupling setting, they have been developed by imagining that the allowed control capabilities can be specified in terms of a group of operation, which is called a decoupling group. So this decoupling coupling group consists of a finite set of unitary rotation which acts on the state space of the system and a bang-bang protocol with the coupling group G is constructed by simply sequentially changing the control propagator through all the group elements according to a determined path in the group. So the control propagator, this is a pictorial um, a description, I'm glad that the figure is there after all. In the first control subinterval is the identity, in the second is equal to the first group element, and so on and so forth until you exhausted all the group elements. And from a physical point of view, that means that at the end of this control interval, what you apply is an instantaneous uh, bang bang pulse, which changes the control propagator from one value to the next. Now, uh, the advantage of having a group structure is because if we go back and compute the lowest order average Hamiltonian theory of the system, it immediately acquires symmetry properties because we are effectively mapping the time uh, uh, average that defines this lowest order Hamiltonian into a group average. So the expression comes about to be this one. We have system. Uh, environment and the coupling terms and this projector here is 
projecting system operator onto the commutant in this way. Now, this is the key, this symmetrization, this dynamical symmetrization of the dynamic is the key for understanding what uh, decoupling does, and in particular, since I talked about subsystem, to link it to the notion of subsystem. Uh, basically, once one has symmetry, the symmetry can be used to filter out unwanted contribution to the dynamics. Uh, so we can use it uh, in uh, closed system evolution, for instance, to halt uh, any evolution under the Hamiltonian, this is maximal decoupling, we can use it to only turn off selective coupling, which is important for Hamiltonian simulation, and going back to the problem I started with, which is decoherence suppression, we can remove altogether the coupling to environment without the need of encoding, there is no encoding here yet, or we can more generally symmetrize the coupling to the environment by uh, basically um, using symmetry to generate a dynamical NS. All of this conceptually fits into a unified picture where the subsystem notion is still the key to understand. And uh, what is the relevant algebra in this case to look at? Well, there is one which is provided by the so-called group algebra of uh, the group, the decoupling group. And again, even though I don't have the time to give you the detail, but formally you should see that there is a complete similarity with the expression I wrote down for the error algebra and this group algebra, which is nothing but the linear combination of group elements. And we have uh, dynamically generated subsystems which uh, are created by uh, decoupling. So since my time is a bit short, I had a very various examples I wanted to discuss, but let me instead mention two problems that are quite critical for decoupling and two possible solutions. Problem one, the bang-bang assumption is clearly very nice uh, from a point of view of theoretical modeling. This is a convenient starting point. is terrible uh, from the point of view of practical uh, realizability. So, uh, because it implies unbounded strength control, even if the control time scale is finite. So, how can one try to achieve the same kind of averaging and suppression uh, that the bang-bang decoupling is able to give us by not having unbounded strength. This is always possible to do, and uh, there is a general method which goes under the name of uh, Euler decoupling, and the idea here is to smoothly steer the control propagator through uh, the uh, through a path coupling with bounded strength. So the problem of infinite amplitude can be solved this way. Another problem which is particularly uh, important for Hamiltonian simulation is the fact that if we have large dimensional systems, uh, decoupling can become very inefficient. It can take you a lot of control slots, a big cycle time before getting to the end. So uh, we have complexity issue and one possible solution is to make explicit reference to the underlying tensor product structure of the state space. This is the key that uh, uh, underlies combinatorial decoupling designs. Again, this was just an example that I put down to give you the essential idea. For four qubit with a bilinear coupling Hamiltonian, if I would like to switch off all the couplings in the simplest possible way, what I will do is to take each qubit and, uh, well, basically average it out with four operation each, and that's four to the fifth. Uh, operation that I have. Um, there is a method which rests on orthogonal arrays which are combinatorial objects like phase matrices, Hadamard, and allows you to basically exploit parallelism in different control operations to decouple efficiently any system which is uh, interacting according to bilinear or more generally T-local interactions. Now, we are, uh, I, I am going to conclude now. I would like you to be careful because all I have said about decoupling uh, rests on just designing the lowest order Hamiltonian, h bar zero. Uh, if you try to um, 
do this for practical system, this is a terrible approximation. Decoupling would be very poor. So it is imperative that better decoupling schemes are constructed, which are able to take care of the higher order of the Magnus series so that convergence of decoupling and performance of decoupling is better. Um, there are various solutions to that that have been proposed recently. One is concatenated dynamical decoupling. I think we are going to hear about this later the week. Another way, another idea is to give away deterministic cyclic uh, decoupling and invoke some kind of randomization to basically avoid, avoid uh, um, coherent error accumulation and to improve convergence at long time. And I think I'm really uh, getting to my conclusions and uh, uh, main message is that it is possible to have error protected subsystems even though systems are always noisy and basically error control in quantum information is consisting of maintaining and fault tolerantly manipulating information in protected subsystem. Uh, you will hear more on how this subsystem idea uh, gives us tool for getting a unified and more powerful conceptual understanding for fault tolerance and to get better codes. And one uh, word I like to stress is the fact I think that ultimately it will be important to merge uh, active and passive control for uh, being able to um, protect information under realistic situations, talking about which realistic situation I think uh, Ray will tell us more about where we stand experimentally. So thank you for your attention. There are some references here and sorry about the extra few minutes. geometry, the Euler idea is a trick that gives you a recipe for switching on and off the Hamiltonians that you have available for controlling the system according to two criteria. One, you want to uh, give them a finite amount of time to affect the rotation that you want instead of affecting the rotation right at the end of the uh, interval in time zero which is impossible, and two, you have to keep some symmetry uh, in this switching sequence if you want that the lowest order average Hamiltonian be the same of what you were getting in the bank band limit. So from this point of view, uh, if you mean...